Hello and welcome to this episode of Superhero Ethics. We talk often about the idea that superheroes are creatures of mythology, both the kind of modern myths that they talk about, but also that like they they echo for us the role that ancient myths have often played. And many of them are based off of ancient myths, even metaphorically, down to Hercules, a literal character. But and we talk about that term mythology so often, but what does it actually mean? What is mythology and how does it apply to the stories we love? And how have people written about this? And so we're going to kick this off with Professor Matthew Capel, recently of Montclair State University, the Fighting Red Hawks. And anytime Matthew's been on this podcast before, the topics such as mythology and anthropology and all these things come up. And I've always thought, you know, I'd love to dive deeper into this. And so today, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to start with just a discussion of mythology itself and then look at one of the uh, kind of seminal works in the field of mythology, the myth of the American superhero, which applies to so much of the stuff we've talked about. And that's going to kind of be something we're going to go back to from time to time. I know at a later point, Matthew and I are also going to talk about Joseph Campbell and the hero of a thousand faces and and all that kind of stuff. Matthew has been making a facial expression indicating his fondness for that book. But we're starting out, like I said, just with mythology itself. And so here's a nice, simple question from the uh, professor. What is mythology? Oh, no, I, I have no idea. <laughs> um, mythologies might might be slightly diff, diff, different than myth. So let can we start with myth? Sure. Yeah. What is a myth? Um, okay. What is a myth? What do you think a myth is? So I approach this. I will say f- as a biblical scholar, and that's the way I uh-huh. come from it. The simple definition I would use is that a myth is a story that contains truth, but not necessarily fact. And that whether or not it's factual is actually fairly irrelevant. Oh, I love that definition. That's a that's a really good definition. We can go with that. Okay. My definition. <laughs> my defi- My definition is a myth, and I'm stealing it from a much more important scholar than I would ever be. Um, my definition of myth is um, um, a story with an ideology in it. Right. Mm. So it's a it's a narrative with an ideology. Yeah. That is to say, humans tell stories, and our stories have significant leanings towards points of view. And when we all tell stories that give similar ideologies, we're talking about myths. Yeah. And the stories, it does not matter at all if the stories are true or not, um, because they actually are true. So maybe we should start by def- dispensing with the notion that myth means false. Mm. Yeah. And So let me talk more about how I see it, because again, it... I would happily talk about most of the biblical stories as myths. And I, I don't use that. I'm a person who loves the Bible. It's the, the seminal work of literature in my world, uh, though we love many others as well. And so there's see many problems in it. But it, one of the things that I learned in, in scholarship, and I'm curious if, if you have other, this is me remembering theories from 20 years ago. But basically, it's the idea that we in the modern age find it hard to understand the limits of human knowledge back in the time most of these myths were written or come up with, but especially before the Enlightenment and before the Scientific Revolution. And that in most of the world, like there was interesting science being done, but most questions people approached were the like that when people talked about Apollo pulling a chariot of fire across the sky, it, if you asked someone, do you think that that is literally what is happening? It's not that they would say, no, it's a myth. I know that it's false. It's that the very idea of asking that question wouldn't make any sense to them. That that for a large extent, the idea was you came up with stories that helped you explain the truth of a situation because you're not really thinking about, is this factual or not? And so, you know, again, with like a lot of the biblical stories, you can see it that way. A lot of the Greek myths, you'd see it that way. Um, even to the point where you know, with some of the stories in the Bible or some other myths, like we know there are some true things that we know there was a flood in Mesopotamia around about the time of the flood mythology story being created. We know there was an actual person named Jesus at some point who was killed by the Romans as they killed many people at that time. Um, 
But the point is that like whether it's based in some sort like what you know the same way King Arthur is another great you know we know Uther Pendragon I'm probably getting the name wrong but we know there was some knight in an, a king in Wales at some point that inspired the myths and the legends of Arthur and in all these cases whether it's whether it's based in a fact or not to me is not the question it's the what is the truth that it it tells us is that how much of that would you if, if that's my paper what what grade am I getting what 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 revisions am I being told to made Oh, that's a straight B plus. Well done. Okay, there we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just being mean. That was that's a great definition, um, and I would probably give that an A. Um, so um, we have this notion that we can talk about other people and their myths, mm. but we don't talk about ourselves and our myths, right? Um, and that's because the definitions we want to hang on to for myth don't really deal with truth in contemporary culture, which yeah. is why people can go, oh, that story, that's just a myth. Um, but in reality, the fact that the story has relevance means it's just a myth. Um, but that's a different thing than saying it's just a myth. Right. Right. Um, and the I think the classic example is the worst president um, after Franklin Delano Roosevelt is hands down until recently Reagan, um, and Reagan used to tell just to the be clear, you mean we... the worst president since FDR? Not that FDR is one of the worst presidents. Am I correct? That's correct. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm just going po- post World War II. If I had to pick a worst president before the most recent last guy, um, I would have picked Reagan. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things Reagan used to do is talk about what we now think of as um, the myth of the welfare queen, this mm-hmm. woman who doesn't work and has lots of kids by lots of men um, and has a Cadillac in front of her house because welfare is paying for everything. Right. Um, and this person never, ever existed. But the story keeps getting told and the ideology behind the story, the racism, the lack of acceptance of um public help um, means that it is a truthful story in that it affects the way we behave, right. even though the actual facts of it aren't correct. And um, because it is such an incredibly racist form of uh, a kind of mythology in American society, um, we can also point out that Americans easily accept stories with narrative truths in them, with narrative right. values in them, with ideologies in them, um, if they are in any way parallel, parallel to their current belief system. Um, and a lot of Americans, okay, let's say all Americans are, are kind of racist. So um, so it's an easy story to pass off as truth, mm-hmm. um, which is why it gets retold, which is why it's a myth. Um, but to say it's just a myth is not an insult Right. I would say the virgin birth is just a myth, um, by which I mean, whether it happened or not, the way we tell the story is the important part, right. not whether it happened or not. And I think right. that's a really important thing is that we're not using the, the phrase just a myth and the idea that, oh, because it's a myth, it's not important, is not as relevant. And it, it's funny, when you mentioned Reagan, I thought you were going to go in a very different direction, though I think it's just as mythological and certainly still very alive today, which is the myth of the perfect America, you know, and that Reagan and, and certainly more recent people have really tried to go back to, you know, why, you know, why aren't we telling the story about how America is the greatest nation in the world? And it always has been. And the divine providence was very much a part of our myth for a long time. In that myth, we don't talk about slavery and the internment of the Japanese and the horrible treatment of Mexicans and Native Americans and all that kind of stuff. Pulling back, though, a bit, or actually maybe, say, narrowing the lens a bit, is it fair to say that not only do we have myths on sort of cultural, national levels, but can families have their own myths? Like when, you know, people talk about, oh, great-grandpa, you know, he always loved doing this and he he – you know, loved great grandma so much. They built this whole, like the stories that get passed down generation to generation. I feel like just because the way people tell stories, things get exaggerated, things get misremembered. The truth of the story of him, you know, your, your great grandpa being the embodiment of thrift or of love or of whatever virtue it is. There's some truth there perhaps, but really it's just a story that the family tells to pass on a value that the family wants to pass on to their kids. Is that 
would that fit also within the realm of mythology or a myth? Yes. Yes, I would say it does. Um, I think there are some myth scholars who disagree with me on that. Mm-hmm. Um, but but I tend to be very anthropological in my idea of myth, which means I think everybody is making myth all the time. Right. Um, so who doesn't have a story, um, if they're in a long-term relationship or have been, about how we met? Mm. And we all tell that story. Um, or my my spouse and I tell the story of how she woke me up um, one morning and went, if we get downtown, they can marry us, but we have to be there before noon. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and we had to get married because they I was moving overseas and the, the country would not give her a visa. So mm. we, so we went and we got married so we could get a visa. Um, and it's a great story. So we tell it all the time when people ask. Yeah. Because we literally got up and ran to downtown Detroit and got married and went to my absolute favorite building in Detroit, which doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> and then then we were able to move to, um, you know, Wales mm. um, and hang out with the myth of Arthur Pendragon. Nice. And so what is mythology then? I think I think I have an idea of it. And if, if I'm right, it's going to lead into my next topic. But what is mythology? Well, simply, it's just the study of myth, right? Mm. Um, but th- there's two two ways to think about this. Um, myth scholars are um, are often shunted to the side. Um, so in myth scholarship, there's not really a meeting we get to go to. Um, there's a religious um, um, group of scholars in the United States, and myth would be their, like, um, I don't know, bastard nephew. Mm-hmm. Um, um, myth is not considered important to scholars of religion generally. Right. Um, but but there's no place else you can go. There was a very famous historian who um, in the early 1980s was president of the American Historical Associ- Association who specifically said myth and history are really close together and nobody would listen to him after that. Interesting. And he was a professor at Chicago. Great book, Myth History. He wrote a book. Um and I, I, as a historian, I completely agree with him. I think history is just myth with footnotes. Um, so myth scholars have that problem. Mm-hmm. So instead of saying we study mythology, myth scholars tend to be people who go, yeah, I study myth. Um, I do mythography. Um, I mm-hmm. write about myth. Because mythography sounds like a fancier word than mythology right. you can add ology to the end of anything right yeah um, um and we do but mythography is a whole different mm-hmm. ball of kittens well and it's interesting because I, I would think that it would fit well into anthropology or perhaps sociology as a like look this is a thing that communities do and the way that they pass down history and stuff I, i'm i'm guessing that there's some connection between the whole like our modernistic take of Oh, it's just a myth. A myth means it's false, and and the idea that mythology is kind of the redheaded stepchild of of this part of academia. Hmm. I say that as a redhead with a stepmother, to be clear. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, anthropologists are of course always better at everything than everybody else. Um, I'm just Sp- spoken as a true anthropologist. <laughs> yeah, um, anth- anthropologists are much friendlier towards myth, but they also. Um, as a as a group have tended to be like myth is just one of the little things we have to take care of so we can get to the stuff that matters and the stuff that matters is not myth Interesting. Um, and there's a very famous anthropological story that i tell in my intro classes all the time um which is um i, th- I think it was um a linguist really not an anthropologist who was talking to a native american um and the native american said why is it what you believe is religion but what i believe is myth Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. And and that is how we others, we, we talk about other people's myths. We don't talk about our myths. Yeah. Um, and, and that's a nice way of creating a really great um, social distinction. Yeah. I mean, and that's why for me as a Christian, I promise this is not going to be about my religion all, all episode. But just to say this, that's part of why I very intentionally talk about my religion as mythology. And both to say that doesn't I don't think that means it's not important or there isn't some truth there, but that it to me the, the connection to historical uh, reality is not what matters, and I'm never going to make a claim of historical reality to it. So, with all that, so 
So with all that, I'm really glad we're getting to explore this. We'll get to kind of the heroes part of it in a bit. Uh, And this is actually, I think, a good way to lead into it. One of the additional things that I think of with myths and and tell and this is what I was I was wondering if maybe this would be the definition of mythology. I totally get why I was way off. But as I understand it, not only do individual myths have this power, but that when a community has central myths that are passed down through the community, and again, that can be, you know, parents teaching their kids about, you know, what the what happened when, you know, grandma came over on the boat a hundred years ago, or great great grandma, whatever it is, or, you know, a group of, you know, believers in a faith tradition or a nation or a city or whatever, that a lot of what the myth becomes then is kind of the the shared language that people can use to have discussions. Because it's very hard to talk about values and things like that in the abstract, but that a lot of times, you know, we'll we'll look at like, okay, George Washington is the symbol of American honesty and and forthrightness. And then when we discuss that, sometimes, we'll, you know, people will reference like, you know, what if what if Washington hadn't, you know, uh, told people about the apple tree or what, whatever it is that like, or same in like, you know, that that religious traditions, it is often people Talk, talking about different interpretations of the story, or as we'll get to, um, the book that we're talking about a little bit today makes a great case that others have made as well, that Star Trek is a community that has a shared mythology. And when people come together, like we do on this podcast, to talk about the shared myths of the Enterprise or of the Jedi or things like that, what what's the role in mythology of it being something that people can discuss like that? Have you ever been in a group of people that you have nothing to talk about with? Yeah, it's really hard. Yeah, shared shared myths are a thing. Um, you you did a, um, something that I had planned to do, which is do the Washington thing. But you know, mm-hmm. um, Americans know their George Washington stories and their Abraham Lincoln stories, um, and you know, so I think Lincoln is footprints on the ceiling of the log cabin kind of stuff mm-hmm. um, in, in mud. Um, and we tell these stories because they bring us together as a community and because they give us something ideological to hang on, on to. Right. Um, and if, if you don't have those two things in a group, you don't have a group. Yeah. So what myth does is offers the social glue that holds communities together. Right. Right. Um, and in, in that sense, um, myths are probably the most important thing in a society that doesn't get studied by scholars. Yeah. And especially because at least I understand it, sometimes, you know, conflict in community can often happen because people are, whether explicitly or implicitly, they have different ideas of the myth. You know, I mean, that's right now in the United States, one of the, the biggest social conflicts we have is over different interpretations of what does America mean and was it great or was it not or what does all that mean or, you know, just families arguing and things like that. And, Again, I don't know how I'd quite put this in the academic terms, but it seems that like a lot of times when a community argues over a shared mythology, that can either lead to a change in the community and the community kind of adopting something new or a split in the community where one group breaks off, um, you know, where, because they have a different idea of what the mythology is or what it means or what it should be. Yes, um, let, let's. Let's try. Let's go back to Star Trek and try yeah. it that way. Um, so there's an anthropologist named Conrad Philip Kotak. I'm just putting his name out there because he's um, he's worth picking up some of his stuff, um, and um, my wife knows him. And um, he has this book called Primetime Society that you would not believe um, what he says about Star Trek, but it's perfect. I mean, and I think he's right. Um, if you're of a certain generation, like old, like me, um, you probably grew up with certain things happening around Thanksgiving in your school. Maybe there was a Thanksgiving play and some people were the Puritans, pilgrims, and some people were the um, Native Americans, the Indians, and one person was the turkey, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, and we tell we tell the Thanksgiving story over and over again, and we have since the Civil War. Um and that story is about bringing separate communities together and, and showing how separate communities can work together. And so Conrad Philip Kotek said, um, and that is exactly what the bridge of the enterprise does as well. It mm-hmm. is a 
reformatting of America's Thanksgiving mythology. People of different backgrounds who look different, who act different, who have different languages, can come together and be one unified thing, which is a central part of American mythology. Right. Um, so the question isn't, is that true for most Americans? The question is, which people can't be part of it? Mm. Um, that's the thing Americans argue about, which is you know, when I teach history, I always make people read this Ben Franklin thing where he's like, we're not going to be true Americans because there's too many Germans moving here. Um um, and he was like really upset about the Germans, um, <laughs> and and it's Ben Franklin, and we we've been doing that ever since. It's the and now it's this group, and now it's that group, and, right. and a generation later, that group is very American. And it's it's, right? it's fitting. So the, so the myth works to affect a, right. a way for people to become part of the society. And it's funny because because again here maybe this is the conflict over different ways of 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 interpreting the myth because that assimilation that happens which and that's a very, a very loaded word and I mean it in a variety of different ways that can be very much a part of the myth but also that when the people object to those groups it's almost always couched in that language of they don't share our values they're not like us they will make america different and and at heart isn't that basically just a they're going to change the myth they're going to they're going to challenge the, the mythological understanding that we have. Yes. Um, let me tell you a story. I think um, I think a, a, a podcast about myth in a general sense needs me to say a lot. Let me tell you a story. Mm -hmm. um, in, in American history, it's a really big deal that um, um, Ford offered his employees $5 a day. Mm. Um, it's a really big, important thing. Right, but Henry Ford, Ford was, the original founder of the Henry Ford Motor Ford, Company. Yeah. yeah. Henry Ford, founder of the Ford Motor Company, um, um, at one point decided to essentially pay his employees twice what anybody else would pay them. Um, people were getting two fifty a day, and he was paying them five bucks a day. But there, that's the story we tell. Yeah. But the background to that story is different because the background is Ford had people going to their employees' houses to make sure they were living appropriately before they got the raise. Mm -hmm. um, and living appropriately was, is English spoken in this home? Um, um, is are, are the children being reared in an American way, which um, at the time was a big deal? Mm -hmm. um, do, are, are people behaving in a proper Christian fashion? Um, and there were certain kinds of wasps that were acceptable and others that were not. Um, and it was not actually so much as like Ford was giving people five bucks a day so they could afford to buy a Ford product. Um, it turned out Ford was giving people five dollars a day so that they would change the way they behaved to be more American as he saw fit. Right. Um, and that is that's how we do it. Right. And isn't that often the case is that the myth, not always, but that myths are mo very often a positive passing down of tradition. And so, of course, you, you leave out the bad stuff. You know, you leave out that great, great grandpa was terrible to great, great grandma or that, you know, the American nation was founded on slavery and, and genocide of, of the native peoples and all these kind of things. And I, I'm seeing an interesting and I, I, I promise we get to the superhero part. This is kind of the last thing I want to bring up on this general point. Do you think this is fair to say that one of the things that we're seeing in our society today is that social media, and particularly the fact that we can learn so much more about the people who are often mythologized, is breaking down a lot of myths? And it's not just social media, it's the press, is the just closer connections as well, because I think, you know, we've had the myth of like the American entrepreneur who becomes very rich and makes the world a better place and everything they did was smart and maybe they were a little bit cutthroat, but they made the world a better place. When we can see Elon Musk's tweets and have that direct access, that loses a lot. But it's also the same thing of, you know, Babe Ruth was this mythological baseball figure because the writers didn't talk about his womanizing or his drink or his drunkenness or all the kind of stuff that today is going to be all over the papers. And so it it seems to and and I think same way in in Great Britain where the royal family has become a lot less mythologized because 
the people now have so much more access through the press and direct appearances and stuff like that. It, it, do you think there's a fair commentary there that uh, even just in the last hundred years and then especially in the last 10 or 20, that those myths are, are being tarnished a lot because we have so much more direct contact with the, the people who are making them or, or who they're about and the like? I think that myths work best when most people don't notice that they're myths. Yeah. Right. Um, so once you start seeing something that used to be a story we told that you are now being exposed very directly, this is not true. Um, it, it's hard to see it as a unifying story for a culture. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that there are no myths. It just means that you have to find the new myths. Yeah. And and what are the new myths? Um, and, and that's an interesting question that leads right to superheroes. Yeah. What are the new myths? Um, because, yeah, no, um, I don't think if I were to say in a history class, which I, I, I also teach history, um, if I were to give the whole like throwing a silver dollar across the Potomac story at, for Washington or I cannot tell a lie, I cut down the cherry tree Washington story. My students, at least when I was teaching in Manhattan, my students would have been like, you should probably be talking about how many slaves he owned. Yeah. Um, because that myth no longer holds water for them. It does not work. Right. Um, but but so you that doesn't mean we have no myths. It means the myths are different. Yeah. I mean, In fact, one of the myths, one of the really important myths is the myth of mythlessness. Mm, say more the about that. Myth that we, the myth that we have no myths. Right. Um, the story is that like, we've, we've progressed. One of the great American myths is progress. We've progressed so far that we don't need myths anymore. Um, yeah. Well, especially because I wonder if we talk about the new myth, uh, I'm pulling us back to the real world for a second, and then I, I'm not even going to keep saying that, you know. And because, like, you know, and again, just to do the one more real world example, uh, and, and about mythology and conflict, it feels to me like with someone like Elon Musk, but also someone like Carnegie, we've always had two myths that are kind of running concurrently. One is of the noble man who is very smart and very dedicated and hardworking and pulls him up by his own bootstraps, and thus makes the world a better place because he makes so much money and makes a product everyone wants and then starts Carnegie Mellon University or whatever. And then the second myth, which is, I think, for the most part, secondary, but sometimes is more in ascendance, is the myth of the greedy millionaire that Americans have to unify to fight against. And that can even be a trip like, and there's a way to make the revolution part of that where King George and the English are that. And I think in our lifetimes, we've seen Elon Musk switch from one to the other. Like, I remember 10 <laughs> years ago, he was lauded as this absolute genius who could do no wrong and that he was going to save environmentalism and he was the future of everything. Staying with Steve, Be uh, uh, Jeff Bezos and Steve Jobs and all the rest. And now a lot of them have shifted into being, and I, I kind of wonder if now we're going to get the myth of the billionaire idiot, you know, who just doesn't know what they're doing. And that'll be a part of it. I don't, I'm, I'm, it's not a myth. Most people in Silicon Valley got lucky once and now think they're geniuses. I'm sorry. It's just it's yeah. the way it works. They're like, I did Facebook, therefore everything I say is going to be correct. Right. Um, and um, so it's a psychological problem. Yeah. So so let's Facebook. actually now go to. Uh, but but okay. no, let me let me um, go somewhere with that. Okay. So the the obvious joke is I miss the days when the obscenely wealthy started new universities and um, built libraries all over America to prove their value as opposed to building rockets. Um, I miss those days. I wish we had billionaires going, we should, we should have more scholarships to like, the universities um, as opposed to, I need to colonize Mars. Mm -hmm. um, and though that would be great. Um, but at the same time, it's important that I say that all, a lot of our myths deal with the obscenely wealthy and what they can accomplish, mm. um, as we will see shortly. Do you think um, that's um, a carryover from like, you know, Greek myths are about the demigods. They're about people who have powers that humans don't have, Hercules and Pericles and all these people. Is is there a thread there between like that? It's But that today, the, the thing that gives you great power is not being born of a god, but is 
being born into or acquiring incredible wealth. Even people who are born into incredible wealth tend to say that they acquired it, don't they? Well, that's true. But but you yeah, know my point. Yeah, like, is, right. Can we draw that but, connection? Yeah, no. The myths always tell the stories of somebody who is special in some way. And yeah. the culture determines what constitutes that specialness. So when you were talking about Carnegie, the, the, the culture was like um, they worked hard and they became rich because they were smart. Um, which is not a bad mythological structure to have if you want to build a nation, I guess. Um, the myths today are different than that when it comes to wealth, though. Yeah. Um, so how we choose to understand the shift between... God, imagine there's an Elon Musk university. <laughs> um, because, you know, Carnegie Mellon and Hopkins and... Um, Stanford. I mean, the guy who founded Stanford was a racist. And if you go to Stanford, there's still a lot of racists there. Yep. Um, all of them are from Ohio, weirdly. Um, <laughs> but it's still Stanford. Um, so, I mean, when those universities got founded, they were almost immediately good universities. If Elon Musk founded a university, it would be Trump University yeah. for internet dweebs. Yeah. Right? Very different. So, okay, so let's talk now about our actual heroes and capes and people like that. Where do super art, where do superheroes fit into the conversation about mythology? I, um, I'm, I'm, I like to tell this story, and I, I know I've told you this before, Matthew, but um, so when we study myths, we tend to create stories that are more general and vague to collect as many different kinds of myths together and make them into something we can talk about. We tend to generalize. All right. Um, so I'm going to give you a general story mm. and I'm, I'm stealing this general story, but um, it's a good one. The normal democratic ideals of a society have failed. Um, the elected members who are supposed to govern the city or the nation are not doing their jobs effectively. There are people who are stepping outside of the law and getting away with murder or theft or whatever. Um, and the police are corrupt and can't deal with it. And the government is corrupt and is not fixing it. And, and even the government is now starting to ruin my life because of their incompetence. So what we need is an insanely rich person who can ignore the accepted rules of democracy and step outside of them. And having stepped outside of them, fix the system from the outside so that it is more just for all of us. And I, that is a story. That is a mythological statement. That is a mythological story. And when I say, who is it? You say that I'm not going to call Jared Kushner Robin. Yeah. Because clearly it's, it's both it, Bruce Wayne and it's Donald Trump. Yes. It's both of them. Um, it's, it's, and and Iron Man, Tony Stark, mm -hmm. right? Um, we tell stories about people who are special and people who are special don't have to follow the rules. That's kind of the general way it tends to work. Um, there's very few times when those stories end with, well, then they get punished for not following the rules vis-a-vis -vis Jesus, right? right? Which is what makes the story so good. Um, uh, mostly um, our mythological heroes don't follow the rules. But if those mythological heroes are essentially telling you that democracy is bad or democracy has failed or democracy does not work, that's a bad thing for a society that's trying to be a democratic republic, mm -hmm. right? Um, so this, the, the most recent really important non-Marvel um, group of films were the Th Nolan Batman films. And I have issues with Nolan, but um, but they were incredibly important and they were incredibly popular um, and they did incredibly well. And I would say I would make the argument that the Nolan Batman films set up the presidency of Donald Trump, hmm. that that it created this like myth. It reinforced the mythological story of the billionaire 
who steps outside of the rules of democracy can fix the problems for me. So I don't have to get involved with my local city council or I don't have to get involved by running for Congress or helping yeah. my congressman do stuff. Um, and that is how myths lead into the real world stuff. Right. They help us understand what normal people are doing. Yeah. Well, I, I, the two responses there, one is just to give another example of that. There was a book called Waiting for Superman that was a book about trying to reform the education system. And it was all about this idea that we have to stop waiting for the outside hero to come and fix it. Now, the author winds up uh, prescribing a bunch of changes to the education system that I, I don't know much about, but that most of the educators I know are very against. So I'm not endorsing it from that perspective, but it's another version of this. I, and I think the, the Nolan one, I mean, I, I admit it cuts deep because it is some of my favorite. Well, the first two are some of my favorite movies. The third, I think, is a, basically an attack on Occupy and really the most pro-cop thing I've seen in a long time. So I'm pretty much in agreement with you there. But I think that there's an extent to which, and this kind of goes back to the point I was saying about people arguing about myths, it's that the superhero myths are great. And and I've always said I like the superhero myths that an, that raise questions more than they answer them. But the problem with that is that people can take them and use them to interpret almost anything they want. Um, you know, the Punisher is a character who's very much meant to be a critique of policing, a critique of vigilantism, a critique of, you know, Frank Castle is a hero, but Frank Castle is also very much supposed to be a warning, a like, this is what we have to not let people become. And so the fact that uh, you know, people who are very much in favor of like, no, let the cops be the cops and do the vi let trust us to do the violence we need to do. You're a stupid civilian. You don't know what we're doing. Don't give us any oversight. Trust us are often like adopting the Punisher into the Blue Lives Matter flag is to me really telling. Um, and, it, you know, and this is like, um, again, I want to focus on the superheroes, but another, to me, another great example is uh, Reagan using Born in the USA, which is a song all about anti-Vietnam, using it about how great America is. Or more recently, uh, someone really upset that the uh, Twisted Sister has all of a sudden, because the, the, peop uh, the song We Are Not Going to Take It was being made into this like Republican MAGA anthem. Uh, and they're so upset that Dee Snyder of Twisted Sister, who appeared in full makeup in the 80s every time he performed, that somehow he was suddenly against MAGA principles. Um, it, I, I have to keep reminding myself to focus on the superheroes because there's so much in the real world that I want to talk about. But yeah, I think that to me, I think it's part of why I love Civil War so much, because I think that. A, By Civil War, you mean the Marvel Marvel Civil War, with, yeah. No, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I am. I, I, I do not have children, but I grill and I, I do tell dad jokes and I have a dad bod <laughs> and I have a whole shelf of books about the history of the Civil War. Uh, so I, I love that history. But no, I mean, Marvel Civil War is fundamentally an argument about the myth of superheroes because the fundamental conflict that the movie then pushes past pretty quickly in order to get to the fight scenes and the emotional stuff – but fundamentally, it's about should superheroes have some level of accountability and to some extent work within the law or should they not? And and is that basically just a struggle over the myth of what these special people should or shouldn't be able to do? I, I think that's the important argument to have. Mm -hmm. um, so, OK. I, th I I I love Batman, but I think Batman is horrible. I just think Batman is horrible. I I, I like Batman. I liked all of the Batman movies in one way or another. Um, but for me, Batman is a very depressing commentary on American society. Yes. Uh, because of the way I presented the story earlier, because we need a billionaire to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes we like make him more likable because his anti-democratic behavior is because he's really sad. Um, as though that's his just uh, that's a reasonable justification for being a fascist. Well, I, I, you you would have had to have bleeped me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but 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 so Marvel Civil War. Um, I have, haven't read the comics, but I've I've heard about them a lot. Um, and you've seen the movie, I assume. Much. And uh, yes, I've watched the Captain America movies far more often than anybody should. Um, thank you to my wife. Um, 
um, the argument about whether or not um, your special powers mean you're special is the argument to have. Mm. So I think Batman is horrible, but which which superhero do we have the most movies about? Batman, probably. No, it's actually Spider-Man. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. And Spider-Man, Spider-Man is better than Batman because of the simple with great power comes great responsibility. Batman doesn't feel that kind of responsibility that that Spider-Man feels, that Peter Parker feels, or Miles Morales feels, that I have these special powers. I'm not trying to like operate outside of the system except in this tiniest little sliver that I can without being unjust. Right. And then I'm going to give the bad guys to the cops. Yeah. Um, and we're going to like say cops are great in this, in this narrative structure. Um, that's a much more hopeful superhero mythology than the Batman mythology is. Well, so here I think there's something interesting. And here I'm going to wind up def- tying in, I think, a central question to all this, but also defending Batman a bit. And I'll start with bigger picture. When we talk about mythology, often we are talking about stories that are hundreds, if not thousands of years old. And a lot of biblical scholarship is about going back and and same with like Greek mythology scholarship or other things like that, is about trying to go back and find what are the stories that didn't become the dominant version of the myth. And, you know, you learn that at the time there were like we have the four gospels. But there's something like 35 Gospels that we know of that were written, all of which were people arguing about what is the myth of Batman. Uh, I'm sorry, of Jesus. <laughs> but I just I just telegraphed my point. I wonder if part of why it's hard to talk about them in the same way is that that's the time period we're in now. We've only been talking about Batman for 100 years, and we have these different versions of the myth. Because, for example, I would say that while, yes, there's a lot of cheesy fight scenes and uh, jump in Jupiter, Batman. The Batman sixty six TV show is very much democratic. He's very much working hand in hand with Commissioner Gordon. Um, the Dark Knight of uh, video games, especially in comic runs, go and I think the movies to some extent. You're right. Go very deep into Batman as the en- as the but the police are all bad, so I have to do what the police won't do. And here's the larger mythological question that I'm going to get to this because it speaks to what you're talking about. And I think this is what the American monomyth we'll get into in a second. As you said, for a person, to, there's a fundamental contradiction in a person saying that because the democratic system of dealing with problems has failed, I am going to step. And, and but what we mean is that part of the democratic system is that certain groups of people are given the ability to use force to deal with problems. Uh, And, you know, we can talk all about the problems of that itself and is that in self-democratic and the like, but that a person who no one has appointed, no one has elected, no one has chosen, Batman is deciding what to happen to criminals or not. And I know that there's a theory and and the myth of the myth of the American, uh, the myth of the American superhero is a great illustration of this. uh, And we can start talking about it more, but I want to get to this point first, that superheroes are fundamentally a contradiction to democratic values. I think that, and I think often they are. I wonder though if also there's another side of the story where the heroes are trying to be a Cincinnatus figure, where the goal is not to say, I will always and forever live outside of this democratic world, but that the, the things have fallen so much that I need to step outside them so that I can help get them back. and. To me, and we can say that that's completely a myth and it's not possible, but I would argue that the two best examples of this are V for Vendetta, where the hero makes a very clear point of saying, I want vengeance against the bad, I want vengeance against the bad system, and I want to inspire other people to build the new system, but I shouldn't be a part of that, and those two things should be separate. But also the the first and second of the Christopher Nolan Batman movies. and. Much like Last Jedi into Rise of Skywalker, I think that uh, the Dark Knight is kind of betrayed by The Dark Knight Rises. But the fundamental thing that Batman is trying to do in that is to say, I was here because the world couldn't, when I started, the world couldn't have a Harvey Dent. And my goal, it, the fact that a Harvey Dent could exist is a sign that the world is returning to a time when I won't be needed anymore. 
And of course, Harvey Dent is turned and that whole thing is challenged. But this has been a very long monologue just to get to, I guess, this fundamental question of, is a superhero fundamentally always anti-democratic or can a superhero be recognizing that the democracy is broken and stepping outside that in an attempt to rebuild it? So what you're talking about is, um, is the superhero temporary? Yeah. Okay. Um, first off, I'm wondering if we should explain the Cincinnati story. Sure. Uh, um, d- uh, I- I'll, I'll go, go ahead. So it is a myth in Roman story that I I think there's it's, it's not it's not a myth he he existed okay it actually is um, historical knowledge okay yeah um it, it very much became I think mythological as the way it was uh, told again and again but certainly uh, based in true fact where basically uh, at a time in Rome's history when it didn't have a strong executive central government focused on one person um because it want it you know it. Rome started, I think a lot of us forget, as a revolution against kings. That's why even when they became emperor, they were never kings. And so you had a kind of diffuse system of power, but then there were the literal enemies at the gates. And so the people all decided to take one of their one of the, the high-ranking members, this guy named Cincinnatus, and to make him a dictator for the purpose of uniting the people during this difficult time of warfare. And and the important part of the myth is that once he was no longer needed. He gave, he stepped down. He handed back that power, and it returned to a non-dictatorship. Yes, I mean he was dictator twice, mm. um, um, and he the first time he gave up power, so they went to him the second time. This is early in the Roman Republic, right? Um, when it was a republic before the republic failed and it became the empire, um, though it never called itself an empire ever, right? Um, and so, um, like, it's like 500 BCE, probably. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so when Rome was still, like, making sure it controlled the Italian peninsula. Um, and part of what Rome had to deal with was a, a um, warrior tribal society called the Sabines. A clue in rebels right here. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and and they were losing. Um they would have um, the way their government worked is they'd have the Senate and the Senate um, would have two leaders in it, each that served a one year term. Um, and both of the leaders in the Senate were failing. Um, they had a former senator named Cincinnatus um, who was just a farmer, a retired farmer. And they went to him and they said, we need you to be the dictator, an actual title. Um, it's not like a, the word we use generally. It was a title to make sure Rome doesn't fall. And so he was the dictator of Rome for, I think, 40 days. Yeah. Something like barely a month. And he defeats the Sabines and he says, I did it and I'm going home. And he goes home. Right. Um, and that, that is the Cincinnati story, which is, by the way, the way we started to talk about George Washington in the early Republic. He was very much yep. a Cincinnati figure. He, they literally um, and said it's a he, great story. They literally said he went back to his farm after the war and then they called him to be president. Calling a plantation owner a farmer, the man never held a till in his life or, you know, held a gardening tool, whatever. But uh, yeah, exactly. So sorry to interrupt, but yeah, just needed to throw that in yeah. there. Um, so this really, really old story of Cincinnati became a way for early Americans to talk about their now mythological figure of George Washington so that it made sense. Um, and so the Cincinnati thing works, but you, Cincinnati got one sequel. He was dictator twice. He got one sequel and then he went home. Um, so, you know, how many Batman movies are there? We can't have... Batman is Lucius Cincinnati um, forever right. um, because he never seems to frickin' go home and take the armor off and stop being Batman, which is the whole point. Right. So I, I am, I'm afraid I have to reject your defense of Batman mm. um, because as long as we keep making new Batman movies, we have a problem well, as a society because we keep because the story we want the story we want is failed democracy that needs an outsider to fix it and we keep wanting the story over and over again which is the which is the symptom that we have to be very wary of right well and i guess my to be clear my point wasn't uh that therefore the entire batman mythos is better than you're making it out to be it's that i think kind of going to my original point 
is that we are at a point in time where many different people are interpreting the Batman mythos in different ways. And that I think what Christopher Nolan did in that second movie, which has been done a couple of times, there's some of it in Batman the Animated Series, and I think some of it also in um, the, the new Batman movie that I, that I really loved the, the, with Robert Pattinson, they were trying to offer a different alternative of what if this is a Batman who is actively working to end the time that he's needed. And I think, you know, even those like decided they needed another movie. And so, of course, it, it, it didn't stick to that. But th- that's my only point is that the Batman mythos is one that is being argued about and that I think you're right. The dominant part of the story is the much more anti-democratic version, but that I think that there are some some versions of the story that do challenge that a bit. I hope you're right. Yeah. Um, right. So the purpose of a surgeon is to do their work so that you don't need a surgeon anymore. Right. Uh, right. If you continually need a surgeon, you're circling the drain. There's a right. problem. Um, Batman can't be a surgeon for democracy. Right. And none of the superheroes can. Um, clue in the uber mention um none of the superheroes can be the saviors of democracy mm. um and i think that's a problem that um, the fact that we like superheroes so much is a problem well but let me push back there somewhat with kind of what i was saying before isn't there a myth of democracy that's part of the story you're telling because for example if the idea yes. is that like you know what's the it, as i was saying like the problem with batman is that he doesn't have the government given legitimate use of violence. It's not like the governmental the people who do have the governmental use of violence that that Batman is challenging do great with that, you know? I think we would both agree that like the the American policing system has all sorts of problems that aren't just things that a surgeon can fix, they're things that need to be torn out at the root. And so so I I definitely hear what you're saying, but I do wonder if there's that there's a danger there also of saying I guess to me, the, 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 the superheroes that I'm most fond of are the ones that hold up the mirror. And Batman, in my favorite versions of him, isn't trying to say, I can be the one to save democracy, as you said. It's, it's and I think V for Vendetta is the perfect endeavor of this, but I think other heroes are as well, sometimes Batman. It's the, I'm going to remind people that they can save democracy. I'm going to remind people that this is not the democracy right now that they think it is. There's the two interpretations, right? Mm -hmm. The system is broken and we have to fix it. And the other side is the system was working exactly as intended and we have to get rid of it. Right. Right. Um, The best meme of that I've seen recently was Barbie and Oppenheimer. Mm. Um, Say um, say more about that. Yeah. But, um, if, is the system broken and fixable, or is the system working correctly and unjust? Right. That is the question. Right. And and, and do you think that there's part, like that there are some superheroes who are more on the second side? Because I definitely think that some of them are. Yes. Um. Uh, I'll go back to Spider Man, but probably the the easy answer um, is um, Captain America. Mm-hmm. Um. In the, in the Civil War movie, he's on the other side than he is in the Civil War comic. Um, um, but but Captain America is very much the America part um, right. in the mythological sense, not in the jingoistic sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's and and Chris Evans did such a good job um, that Captain America does a really great version of. The system can be fixed. I will help you fix it, but I will not take it over. Um, which is not a thing that Iron Man would ever really do. Yeah, Iron Man would be like, well, "I don't even care about the system." Either put me in charge, um, or seems... I don't. Yeah, like the uh-huh. fact that Chris Evans, yeah. uh, Steve Rogers, is very quick to obey Nick Fury in a way that Tony is not. Yeah. Although, um, so the question is, how do we feel about um, hierarchical authority? Mm-hmm. Right. Well, and in Captain America's case, I actually feel like you have three different perspectives that he goes through. He starts out as the system is just fine 
and I'm just kind of a super cop. I am a part of the democratic system. I've been created by the democratic system, and the democratic system gets to give me orders and tell me what I should do. Uh He becomes, there's a problem in the democratic system. I have to cut it out. I have to change it. And I have to remind people to get back to the democratic system. And then I, I, to me, he goes from the super cop to the surgeon to the wrecking ball, to the mm-hmm. Hydra has penetrated all levels of this, and it does have to just be completely torn down. I think that's a good interpretation. Um, I, I just suddenly was reminded of um, in the, I guess, the late 40s through the 50s, Superman a lot talked about um, racism being bad. Right. <laughs> um, when none of the people who loved Superman um, were okay with that. Um, and, um, you know, the first, the Christopher Reeve super, the first two Christopher Reeve Superman movies features a scene in one of them where he literally carries an American flag back to the White House and puts it back on top and mm-hmm. says he's here to help. Um, and, and that's a much better superhero than. I'm really sad and depressed and I have a gravelly voice. Yeah. And it's funny because I think from the political science standpoint, Superman is is the victor there. From the interesting story point, I find Superman incredibly boring. <laughs> I know Jessica Plummer keeps telling me I shouldn't, but uh but I get it. I think that there are there're definitely dangers and it 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 kind of goes I guess the only thing that I would push back on is there as well is I think there's a danger in saying because of how people interpret a story that that is the defining way we understand the story. And I'll, one of my favorite examples of a American myth is, you know, John Brown. John Brown is a, a person who the myth has dramatically changed in the last 75 years or so or 150 years. You know, first he was seen as like the, the epitome of activism gone wrong, of activism becoming terrorism and the like. And now he's looked to as this incredible freedom fighter and an incredible a superhero, I think, in some ways, because literally he's doing all the things you're talking about. He's going, the law is saying that slavery is legal. He knows that that is fundamentally wrong. He's going outside of the law and using violence to try and end slavery. And one of the groups that looks to him as their founding superhero because in their mind, he's fighting to defend the rights of people that the rest of the world doesn't think are people is the hardcore bomb abortion clinics people. Like that's they mm-hmm. claim him as their founding father because they think that's the, the term of the myth. And and again, like the Punisher and the cops. And so I just I, I definitely hear where you're going and we, we're kind of dancing around the a myth of American superhero. And so we should get into that directly. But I th- that's my pushback, I think, that I had with a lot of the book, but also with what you're saying is that. I, I think a world in which superheroes become permanent is very problematic. You're completely right. And here I think there's a fundamental paradox in superhero media in that it's very hard to tell a story about someone who stops being the character when there are billions of dollars to be made by continuing to make the character again and again and again. And I, I just want to have some defense of the fact that I do think there are a lot of superheroes who within their own stories, are trying hard to either be the surgeon or the wrecking ball, but not. But they understand that a world in which a superhero needed shouldn't be the eternal. But it's kind of belayed by the fact that we then keep telling the story again and again and again. Yes. So let's be, let's be scholarly. Yeah. Um, I, I, have, I, I have quotes. Mm-hmm. So we've been dancing around the fact that permanent superheroes is a problem. Um, recent movie grosses look like it's not as much of a problem as we thought. Um, and so there's this thing called the American Monomyth, um, which was originally written in a book in, in the 1970s by a philosopher and a theologian um, named Robert Jewett, the theologian, and John Shelton Lawrence. The um the philosopher um and I know John Shelton Lawrence I did a book with him so um I'm going to be biased I think mm-hmm. he's a great guy, um, what they were interested in doing was showing how America had taken regular mythology and made it problematic, um, um and at the time um right at the moment in when Star Wars is coming out 
At the time, regular mythology was looked at as the Joseph Campbell mythology, um, what Joseph Campbell called the monomyth. Um, and I'm just going to read you his description of this, what Joseph Campbell said is, this is the basic myth of all humanity, um, which is this. A hero ventures, ventures forth from the world of common day into a region of supernatural wonder. Fabulous forces are there encountered in a divisive victory is won. The hero comes back from this mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons on his fellow man. That's Joseph Campbell in the 1940s. Um, and that is basically every Western hero myth. Um, he was not nearly as universal as he hoped he was, but let's not, let's not worry about that right now. Um, that is, that is a way of describing a mythological structure that captures a lot of different myths from, from Jesus to, um, oh shoot. Um, who's the guy who gave us fire? Um, uh, Prometheus, but he also, he, he Prometheus, pulled, he pulls in a lot of, um, Hindu myths. Although I know a lot of Hindu mm -hmm. scholars have had great problems with how he interprets those myths. Yes. And yes. Um, and, um, so uh, we're recording this because we don't want to talk about uh, Star Wars during the strike. Um, Joseph Campbell has a series of books after his most famous book called The Masks of God, um, which is a way of saying that all of our myths are really about the same thing when it comes right down to it. And every time I see the intro to Star Wars now where they go through the masks and those masks change mm -hmm. um, depending on the show, I think of the masks of God. I think it's just beautifully done mm -hmm. um, for me personally. Um, and, and so the question for 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 Campbell was, do we have universal myths? And his answer was, yes, we do. Uh, but th he had the same problem that all myth scholars have. Um, every time a myth scholar defines myth, there's a myth that gets left out because of the way they defined myth. Right. It's a virtually an impossible thing to define. So along come Jewett and Lawrence in the 70s, um, and they they propose something they call the American monomyth. And I'm going to read their description. And as I'm reading it, I hope the listeners will think of Batman and, and Iron Man. And I don't know. Has anybody seen Shane? Does anybody watch Western old Westerns anymore? I mean, John um, Wayne, the cowboy is very much an American myth, yeah. just as much as Superman today. Yes. The riding off into the sunset. Is right. the important part there. So here's here's their definition. A community in a harmonious paradise is threatened by evil. Normal institutions fail to contend with this threat. A selfless superhero emerges to renounce temptations and carry out the redemptive task. Aided by fate, his device, decisive victory restores the community to its paradisical condition. The superhero then recedes into obscurity. The recedes into obscurity is a really important part um, that sequels don't allow. Um, and that is um, a really general myth structure for Americans um, from our Westerns um, to our superhero movies. Uh, it works really, really well. Um, sometimes the, um, you know, into obscurity is death though. Um, and that is part of our myth uh, and for Americans as well. Um, I'm always reminded when I read this of, of, of the death of Abraham Lincoln. Um, because Abraham Lincoln was um, probably the best president we ever had because he saved the Union, um, though how we define best is a silly thing. Um, but it's important to remember how perfectly his death aligned with what it needed to align with so that he could become who he became after death. So he was shot in Ford's Theater on Good Friday. Yep. And Everybody found out about his death because of the way news worked in 1865. The vast majority of Americans found out about that death in church on Easter Sunday. Yeah. And you are not ever, ever going to have a mythological structure work so perfectly again. If I wrote that as a Hollywood script, people would go, it's unbelievable. Right. Um, but it's perfect. Um, so what we, what we as Americans tend to do is look at, 
at that exact thing. But the whole how Lincoln wins the war is the American monomyth. Um, he totally does things that are illegal for presidents to do. Yeah, I mean, because he has he has to do them or or else. To me, he's the Cincinnati. Um, he he's yes. I, part of why I argue sometimes with the best president is because he he. He's the closest I think America's had to a dictator and for a very noble, just cause. Um, but but he suspends habeas corpus. He does all kinds of other, uh, you know, he he's the one who says, I'm going to step outside the bonds of power that I've been given in order to save the whole thing. Yep. I, I also think interesting is that I, cause I saw a study once of uh, this was a poll like 20, 30 years ago, but it was uh, they they asked, you know, a whole bunch of people from all across the U.S., when did Lincoln free the slaves? And the most widely held <laughs> belief is that he either had done it or announced he would do it when he became president, and that that's why the South seceded. And that the South, they did they knew that he was more anti-slavery than any other president who'd come along since then. But that the fact that Lincoln openly said he was willing to not free the slaves, it could save the Union, and that he only did so much later into the war, is totally forgotten. And that's that's again like the facts aren't fitting into the myth itself. Let's also remember what the Emancipation Proclamation actually proclaimed, um, which was, "Henceforth, all of the slaves in areas we do not control are free." Right. I mean, it was very specific. Um, it would be like me going, "All the robots of Mars are free." Like I have any control over Mars and the robots there. Um. Um. Mars is a planet populated wholly by robots, so they should be free. Um, and the Emancipation Proclamation never freed any slaves because it only existed as a propaganda tool during war. Um, I'm freeing all of the slaves in places where I do not have control right now is not freeing the slaves. Right. Um, it's just not. Yeah. Um now, Juneteenth is a national holiday, and I think it's just awesome. But we, yeah, we ascribe too much to Lincoln mm. um, that he that he didn't do. Right. But that's how myth works. We always ascribe the really important things to some mythological figure, right? Um, right? And so, um, so in the in the English language, in the English language, um, the most books in English written by a single about a single person, the winner is Jesus. Number two is Abraham Lincoln. Hmm. That's hilarious. And I think that I think that's significant. Well, and so pulling that back to the monomyth idea. So so where do superheroes fit in this idea of the monomyth? Or well, actually, let me just pull it back even further. So what is their take on the monomyth? Because it clearly sounds like uh, I've read the book too, but I want to let you continue. What's the problem with the monomyth? Well, I can just like. <sighs> Normal institutions fail to contend with this threat, um, is the problem with the American monomyth. Um, it starts with believing that democracy is built to fail. And to a certain extent, democracy is built to fail. That's why it's so good, right? Um, and um, this notion, this notion of we need a outsider hero who then will ride off into the sunset one way or another, um, is a narrative structure that we as Americans have worked through all of the stuff we think is important. Mm -hmm. We interpret, the, we in, a huge section of American Christians interpret the Bible in that way. Because um, there are some really great stories to talk about that, if you really think about them, are about a singular hero fixing the broken system from the outside. Yeah. Um, which is not which is not an emphasis that a Christian in England would use. It's just not. Um, so this this way of thinking of heroism has changed the way we interpret our politics and our Bible. Um, and um, our popular culture and what constitutes a good story on television or at the movie theater. And and it it colors the way we interpret everything, which is why it's a myth, which is why it's a mythological structure that we have to contend with and think about. Certainly, I think one of the best examples that I, I, I read 85 percent of the book, I, I did not get a chance to fin finish it, but I don't think that they talk about this in the book. But shameless plug here. Uh, if you go way back into the the archives of Star Wars Universe podcast, and I'll probably actually just link it in the in the show notes, 
I did a podcast with Becky Allen where we talked about a different myth, but one that I think is very wrapped up in the mono myth, which is the one great man of history idea. And, you know, mm-hmm. that and that part of the thing is that I think they're ascribing one reason to a sociological event is very difficult. But I think one of the reasons why things like labor unions and other Ma- you know, people look at France and are like, why can't we do mass organizing on that scale? Why can't we have national strikes? And, and one of the things that Becky pointed out that I, I've since done more scholarship on and a lot of people have talked about is that it is the problem with this American monomyth is that when you always are waiting for Superman, when you're waiting for that one great person to come along, it's a lot harder to get people to say, no, we are all Superman. We should all join the union. We should all, you know, go out and protest or, or whatever it is. And I, I, I they never quite go. They don't use that quite that language, but I think that's a point that is definitely implied through a lot of this book that I really appreciate it. Yes, but and I, I don't even have to say anything after the but. I don't think. No, I have no idea what I mean, direction you're going. So please, please do. Yeah. So there's this notion in American culture, much bigger than the American monomyth, um, that that sees the way in which. Um, our progress works is through violence. Um, and if there's, if there's a thing that Americans share, truly share with Marxists um, in a broad sense, um, it's even the anti-Marxist Americans believe that history is progress. Mm. Right. And um, I'm an American. I have a hard time not thinking history is progress because I really like the new insulin I'm on. Mm. I see progress all the time. Right. <laughs> um, and um but americans are are unique well, maybe not unique um are relatively unique um which is a horrible phrase um <laughs> in that they think they think that the progress comes through violence um a whole there's a a trilogy of historical works that each one is like 1800 pages the first one of which um is called regeneration through violence um which suggests that all the time we need to be good and 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 a better group um, always starts with violence. Violence is the thing that makes us new. Um, as uh, an, um, as a war um, scholar once said, war is the thing that gives us meaning. Um, violence is the thing that makes America understand itself. Um, and if for the regeneration through violence was the frontier line. Um, as we moved into the frontier, we were. In, violent and civilizing and violent and civilizing it as we went along. Um, and that is a integral part to the way in which Americans think of their progress. Progress is not something that happens in committee meetings. Mm. Um, progress is something that happens on the streets um, with Molotov cocktails or um, on, on breeds in Bunker Hill or wherever. Right. Um, progress requires violence, um, not that progress doesn't sometimes, but for Americans, progress always seems to. Mm-hmm. That's that's the mythological underpinning to be worried about. Well, and so here, I, I love that you're saying what you're saying at because this, I, 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 you and I are not in the same place with that, and I think this is my fundamental disagreement with the book. Um, and I, I'm trying to, I don't just want to give a ten minute monologue about that, so I'm trying to figure out how to break this down in a couple of different pl- parts. But the first thing I'll say is, first of all, I want to be clear that those mass movements that I was talking about are by no definition, you know, always violent. And I think that that, that there's a myth that is all, like the myth of BLM, you know, riots and all sorts of stuff is a very important myth to challenge. Uh, same with the idea that like, and, you know, a hundred years ago, they would always talk about like unions are terrible because union rallies always turn violent. And it's no, the Pinkertons are attacking and it turns into self-defense. Um but I know that's where you were going, but I just want to kind of clarify that. I think, though, to me, but let me back up and just kind of talk about the book in general. There's so much I love about the book, and I think it's, it is speaking to so much truth about a very true story in America. And the, the American monomyth is very, very real. And certainly, um, I, I didn't get a chance to jump in with this about Campbell, but I think one of the problems that I see with Campbell is that while he has done some scholarship as an outsider to mythologies that are not from the culture he's a part of, he is doing the very Western academic thing of taking his view and applying it to everybody. And I know that certainly to me, some of the best critiques of Campbell have come from people from very different cultures saying, 
you are fundamentally misunderstanding our myth because you are seeing it through your Western lens. And so I really love how they narrow it down to the American monomyth and the stuff about the individual, the stuff about the, the person who will rise and fade from history and all of that. I think, though, that, and I'm, I am a person who, who bottomed out with a master's degree in a professional degree. I do not have the academic uh, rigor that even you or the, the professors who, who wrote this book have, so I want to be very aware of that. For me, though, I think there's another myth that I grew up with that is now being challenged, which is the myth of nonviolence, which is the Martin Luther King is the embodiment of all that is good and pure of modern American progress, and Malcolm X is the example of everything that is wrong and bad. And that if minority groups just, and again, I'm going to be very clear, this is not actually Martin Luther King, this is the myth of him, that if minority groups just ask nicely for their rights and you know, let people be aware of their suffering, but then suffer for the viewing of everybody else, that eventually Americans will find it in their heart and will do the right thing. And I, I don't think either you or the, or the people who wrote this book are buying into that at all. But I do think that as a part of that, the, the blurring that happened is the difference between aggressive violence and self-defense. And that people often would look at like the Malcolm X's of the world as, as, you know, they're so aggressive and not understand what he was talking about was violence is being done to my community constantly. I'm just advocating that we don't turn the other cheek. And, and that even Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King was not a pacifist like Gandhi. He was the first to say like, yeah, give me armed troops to help get those little girls into the schools. Um, it's just that he didn't want to use violence as a specific organizing tactic, as a strategy. Where, uh, this is turning into the long monologue, and I apologize, and so please jump in anytime you want to tell me how wrong I am. But I think, therefore, as a part of that, we equate any kind of violence as the same. And in superheroes, we get this all the time, where someone will say, I will not kill, and I will not murder, as though they're the same thing. As though fighting back in self-defense and that causing a death of someone, or even fighting against someone who is a threat to you, is the same thing as plotting their murder. And where I really, and yes, it is because I love Star Wars that the Star Wars chapter is the one that I think I objected to the most. But because in the Star Wars <laughs> chapter, one of the things that he talks about is how, you know, it's not really as, he basically says that Star Wars is fascist. I, I think they, they specifically say that because the idea being that the rebels are still using violence to fight for their republic. And he talks about how, you know, they give a great speech about violence and then they just go up and blow up the Death Star. The authors, though, fail to mention that the Death Star was literally seconds away from obliterating a planet full of people and had already obliterated a planet full of literal billions of people. And to me, especially when you tie it in specifically and say governmental fighting for government through violence is inherently fascist, I have to ask, please tell me when Hitler was outvoted. He wasn't. He, Hitler was defeated through violence. Democracy was restored to Germany through violence and to most of Europe. And the democracy that was restored is highly problematic. I mean, I, I think one thing we can say about all of this is that is the problem that these heroes are challenging democracy or that actual democracy has never really existed. It's always been oligarchy and cops and all this kind of problem. So that's a whole other set of can of worms. So I, I, I guess that's just where I, I am defending superheroes a bit, because I, I think that the idea that the use of violence is inherently fascist, even when it is the use of violence to try to create a system of a more democratic government, I, I, I just can't believe that. And, and, and I'll close with just saying that it's where, again, V for Vendetta is, to me, my perfect embodiment. It's why I love V for Vendetta so much, because... What V does is he says, I will use violence to clear away the things that make everyone so afraid of nonviolence, of being nonviolent. And he does that. And then all the people who he inspired march on the troops who don't fire. And the actual democratic revolution that happens is completely nonviolent. It's just inspired by this man of violence. Okay. Uh, we'll time it later as either a seven minute monologue or even 15. Tell me all the ways I'm wrong. Um, it's impossible to tell you all the ways you were wrong um, because 
it's not a it's not a monologue that needs to be picked apart that way. I will say in defense of um, Jewett and Lawrence that I think their big issue with blowing up the Death Star had more to do with how it was presented narratively to make the audience excited. Mm-hmm. Um, that that the violence itself was the exciting thing, and um, um, as it happens, so we were preparing for this. You read eighty five percent of the book. Mm-hmm. I've read the whole book, but not recently. But I I like I have a cop an electronic copy, and so I I was I went through it again on my iPad. But sitting down today, I I picked up the hard copy, which has like a lot of notes um but one of the things that i kept and i don't know why i kept it um but one of the things i kept was the note from the person who sent it to me which was their uh publisher um a guy named rinder van till um um, and it's like i'm sending you this complimentary copy from because the authors asked me to i hope blah 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 you'll review it or something and i think i wrote a review in some academic journal um but I had forgotten Rinder Van Til. Rinder Van Til um, was a, worked at the publishing company that makes that published this book, um, which is Erdman's, which is in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is perhaps one of the most conservative Christian places I've ever been. And I'm from Michigan, um, so I've been there a few times. Um, and he's also related somehow to um, uh a really important um, theologian named Cornelius Van Til, mm. um, who's like the guy who makes Calvinism important again. Um, he's like a straight up neo Calvinist, you know, um, the free will is yeah, problematic. Um, and so this guy who I would associate with um, a very specific kind of Christianity, um, was really excited by The Myth of the American Superhero as a book because it actually was not like that. Um, it's a it's a very open-ended um, liberal argument to make. Um, and so you had this long monologue. Here's my critique of your long monologue. I have no critique. Um, the thing about long monologues is we're interpreting the myths when we do them, and the interpretations are the things that are um, worth talking about. Mm-hmm. And you don't discount the interpretation. You just react to the interpretation. Mm-hmm. Um, so I reacted to your little Death Star thing, um, but probably more from me than from them. Um, that's how that's how societies work. Yeah, I mean, I'm both an anthropologist and a historian. And if you were to ask me how I could tell if a society was failing, I wouldn't say it had to do with economics or social units or anything. I would say, you know, a society is on its way out when it ta- stops sharing the same stories together. Yeah, That's it. As soon as they're not sharing the same stories, you need to be worried. Um, but I'm also, uh, by training as an anthropologist, can I just primarily say one- as a bio. One thing on that, yes, and I think a great example of that is um, the X Men are one example where you have Magneto and Professor X at various points of the story either have fundamentally different ideas of what it means to be a mutant, or or they're more agreeing or they're more disagreeing. And in our own world, uh, you know, a lot of people today would say that like the the difference in like red state blue state of us just fun we have such fundamentally different understandings of the American myth that it's almost becoming two different stories is. I mean, the perfect illustration of what you're talking about there. Yes. Um, okay, but as as an anthropologist, I was trained as a biological anthropologist, which means I taught human evolution and human genetics a lot when I first started teaching. Um, and I, I'm pretty good at teaching them, though I, I wouldn't call myself a evolutionary anthropologist anymore. But here's an evolutionary thing that I think is important that can be used as a metaphor. When you're looking at traits in a population um, from an evolutionary perspective, the less variability there is in the trait, the better the trait is working. Um, when you see a lot of variability, it means that a that, that there's um, biological experiments going on to see what's going to work going forward. Um, so when you see see a lot of variability in uh, blood types. Um, That is a statement about how we have not 
been dealing we have not been evolving those particular things um, in a way that led to a single conclusion if you change a couple of genes for putting together a heart you don't have a person anymore you have a dead thing right. um, but you can change a couple of genes for eye color um, and still have a person right mm -hmm. um, and the variability there tells us something about evolutionary experiments. I think the variability in American myth right now is exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's as problematic as we think. I don't think I don't think the red satyrs are going to march into the blue states um because there are blue people in the red states and red people in the blue states. Very if, true. Very if, true. Right. Um and and the fact that we are experimenting with different interpretations of American mythology is just a statement that we are trying to figure out what progress is for us as a people right now. Um, and the question is, can we figure that out? Well, and I guess that's actually, that is a fantastic point. And I, I wonder if that's the perfect lead into uh, the, the much more summarized version of my long monologue of my, my, my only critique, because I do think like so much of this book is dead on. My only critique of what they, and I think to some extent you were saying of superheroes being the reification of this myth is I feel like that is probably true for the majority of superhero stories and certainly for a lot of superhero stories. But I think, I, I would argue that more recently, a lot of the writers of these stories, both on film, but also in books and in comic books, where often you can probably stray a lot further, have very consciously been aware of that and actively been trying to to make their version of a superhero story in argument, like to put it in dialogue with a monomyth and change it. And so that's where you get the image of the the like Batman being so sad and broken is not part of a lot of those original stories. And it's certainly the idea that maybe he's wrong is never a part. Today it is. Um, Becky Allen and I talked about one thing, we, the, what we got onto that talk about the myth of the rugged individual, which I think, again, is tied in, but not exactly the same. It was because of Rogue One, where the writers had very consciously said, we want this to be an ensemble movie because we want it to not be about that one great hero. We want it to be about a team of people. And... I, I guess to me, what I, what, I, what I would say is that instead of thinking that heroes are a product and a reification of the monomyth that's problematic, that because the monomyth is so strong, superheroes like any part of our culture are going to be in conversation with the monomyth, but that I think it's a great conversation because it opens us up to the critique as, and, and that a lot of them are engaging in critique of the monomyth, some self-awarely and some not rather than it just being a repetition and a strengthening of it. Yes, I see exactly what you mean, I think. Um, and yeah, that, that's kind of the point. Um, and I will, I will agree that there's a lot of credit to be given there. Um, I, I think a lot of it goes to Tony Gilroy. Mm -hmm. um, right. Um, so I've been thinking about a term. I actually asked you about this on Facebook, Matthew. I've been thinking about a term a lot because I, I needed to use it for a, uh, an introduction to a book I was writing. Um, uh, the term is eschatological hope. Mm -hmm. um, an eschatological hope. Um, eschatology is the study of the end of the world. It tends to be part of Christian um, um, theology, but it, it, it works everywhere. Um, and eschatology is, you know, what happens at the ending of the world and immediately thereafter. Um, and so I, I just edited a book on uh, the PlayStation game Horizon Zero Dawn and its sequel, um, which takes place a thousand years after the end of the world. Exactly a thousand years, which was a weird number. Um, it has nothing to do with Jesus, nothing. Um, and it reminded me of what the um, um, uh, myth of the American superhero book says about eschatological hope, which is um, it's a thing in which people who um, are part of the outside um, can, through their violence in the American monomyth, um, become part of the structure of the mythology again. That the end of things allows the outsiders to become part of things that is the new thing. Mm. 
Um, and and I kind of I kind of think that that's where we're at. Um, we're all questioning if we're part of this American system. Yeah. Um, and I think we should have eschatological hope. I think we should think that the parts of the American system that we can finally get to the point where we agree these are the things that need to be fixed will allow us to expand who's included in it yeah. um, so that the exiles will feel as though they're part of it again. That's the hope part. I mean, to quote Martin Luther King, you know, the, the idea of the, the arc of history b- bends towards justice. To me, it's not it is by no means coincidental that that is a Christian pastor saying that uh, because it's a very eschatological idea. And, and it's so much about just the fundamental basis of how you think that it's kind of hard to get people who aren't ra- who are raised in an eschatological world like we all are, because if, if, even if you're not Christian and also there's a lot of eschatology in Islam. Um, it's just the idea that time is linear, that, that, that history is linear instead of being cyclical, like it is in a lot of other places. And so, yeah, that idea that like, we can have the hope that it's going to get better and better and better. Um, totally agree with the last, well, the, you know, and we, we also all, um, in the United States were raised in a world where, um, there was a nuclear eschatology to deal with. Yeah. I mean, we all expected the end. We all expected the end to happen probably within our lifetimes. And there's still a huge group of Americans who would say that. Um, Now they're talking about the return of Jesus, um, not, you know, um, the Soviets nuking us, but we still talk about how the world is going to end a lot, um, which is why we have so many zombie stories. Yeah, I think it's very true. The last thing that I will kind of, maybe it's call it pushback, or maybe it's just engaging in further dialogue with both the, the authors and with you it is what you said about the problems of trying to tell the stories of our values and or trying to raise these questions about like important questions about what is the nature of democracy and how do we deal with problems within a democracy and, and all those things and problems being like problematic individuals or groups or whatever it is um, with the, the idea of who gets to decide what being problematic being a very important question there. Um, and and, and then, yeah, I can understand, like I, I'm on record as saying I want civil war where it's just Tony and Steve argue, arguing for two hours about what should happen. But instead, to make the movie, you got to have violence. You know, I I have loved that the Star Wars TV shows and even more than novels are giving us a lot more of the people sitting in rooms debating what sh- what should the nature of democracy be after the Republic. And I think I, I credit some of the shows of. I think are actually addressing some of the points that were brought up about what happens when you try to return a republic through warfare and what happens with that. I definitely, I think there are some good points there, even if I think they go too far. But here's the thing. Star Wars has taught me an incredible amount of values and has given me a place to think about my values and challenge my values, and they've changed over time. Star Wars has informed me to be, I think, a better person, a better citizen. But at five years old, I didn't watch Star Wars because of Luke and Yoda talking about the nature of anger. I watched because the X-Wings were cool. And <laughs> when I was a kid, you know, if there were vitamins I needed to eat, my mother would sometimes, you know, stir them into something I wanted to eat. And I guess I wonder, like, yes, violence is probably too much a part of the American character and I'd like to see more stories about nonviolence. And, and honestly, I think the return of American unions and the fact that we're starting to pay more attention to the protests in other places. Like, to me, BLM was a, a great uh, movement forward against that kind of story. Because, again, BLM is not inherently violent by any means. It's when the cops attack it. Don't, that it, uh, don't use the past tense. Okay, thank you. My, my apologies. Um, it, because, yeah, you're right. It's very much still a current thing, uh, to be sure. But if the point of story, if, if you're saying that the, the, we want stories that will pass along values or give chance for people to talk about ideologies and values, you have to get them to pay attention to the story. And, and so I guess that would be my pushback of like, I think the way capitalism makes us tell stories is really problematic and like there always has to be a love story uh, or there's never a love story. And that's just as like all, all of that I agree with. I guess I just I don't see it as quite a much of a problem because. I know people, white people, who didn't really understand subtle racism until I've gotten great listener feedback from people who said, look, I never really understood 
what people were talking about by like microaggressions and subtle racism until I watched Falcon walk into a bank and try to get a loan and saw the way the loan officer treated him of like assuming he was an athlete or, you know, not not thinking of him and treating him very differently than they would a white person. And so I guess that's kind of my final pushback is I, I overall think superhero stories are fundamentally good because I do think that they. Well, let me put it this way. Actually, I would say I don't think superhero stories are good or bad. I think they're a tool and I think they're a tool that can be used to recreate the American monomyth and all its prob- problematicness or it can be a tool used to challenge it. Um, so in, in other words, you're saying superhero narratives are good because they can help us change. I'm saying they have the potential. Because if that's what you, I'm saying, that, yeah, that's the, what I mean. The, they're a tool, the, yeah. Yeah. Then what you're saying, um, which goes all the way back to the beginning, is um, superheroes are good because they're mythological. Because it's through myth that we figure out how to change. Yeah. Um, which which is a perfect conclusion to have. Um, and I cannot argue with your point. I, I agree with your point completely. I'm just less optimistic about it. That's fair. That's certainly fair. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I, I think that makes total sense. And I, and I definitely think, honestly, the strike is giving me a little hope as well. Because I think it is very hard for myths to challenge the underpinnings of society when the people who benefit most from the current society as it is are profiting are the ones deciding what myths get told and not told on screen. And uh-huh. I do think that a lot of the things that are pushing the furthest are things like V for Vendetta or the TV show Shira or a lot of the independent comic books or, or novels or things like that, where it's, it's further from the hands of the profit centers and they're still going to make a buck to be sure, but, but there's more chance to, you know, really challenge the, these things without, you know, someone from Warner Brothers or Disney going like, eh, that, that's a little too radical for our air. So the reason Star Trek is better than Star Wars is because they have better meetings. Um, the best episodes of Star Trek always take place in one room and they're always a meeting. Um, and the discussion of what's going to be important is told through myths. It just is. So if we use superheroes to do that, good. If we use heavily fictionalized biopics to do it good if we if we use um comic books good um if we use um speeches from the president um good it's the stories and yeah you're right about the strike it's the myths are stories and the storytellers are on strike that that that's that's scary because the writers are the most important people in that oh i think you're right we, I have one more big question I want to ask you, but we've gone way over time. So I'm going to save that for the members. So uh, it, the, the question is going to be about uh, what, it, what it is when we know that the myths are when, – when we know the people writing the myths as opposed to myths that are passed down and all the like. And um, uh, it, it is a great time to become a member. Uh, all members, you only have to pay $5 a month or $55 a year. Oh, it, it's basically the same thing as Patreon, but we're now I have joined the True Story FM family of podcasts. So it's not a member; it's now a membership there. But you get access to all this great stuff, ad-free content, bonus content, um, access to the, the the. There's a great True Story FM Discord, which is a great way to talk to me. That's in the show notes. But there are some member-only channels. We're going to start doing some member-only live feeds. So great time to become a member. And right now, uh, during the strike. 25% of everything that comes in from membership. And this is, therefore, at this point, it's a donation both from me and the True Story family of podcasts. Uh, 25% of that goes directly to the, the strikers, the, the funds to help the people who are on strike and all the other people who are affected by that strike. Um, but if you're not a member, of course, there's also still lots of great ways to get in touch with us. Um, you know, if you go to theethicalpanda.com or go and find this show on True Story, the no, the the links to all of that will be in the show notes. You can find all the ways to contact me on uh, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, email, etc. Um, I at some point will probably jump the ship of uh, Twitter, but I'm waiting for like a solid ship to pull up next to it because right now I have invites for eight different platforms that, and I can't keep track of that. Uh, but you know, always contact me on social media or there. Would love to hear you. And of course, if you have feedback about this, Matthew's definitely going to be back at some point talking about mythology and we'll probably do your feedback then. So, but if you want to talk to you directly, Matthew, uh, what should they know about you and how to follow your cool stuff? Well, I'm an anthropologist and historian, as I've said more and more, uh, more times than I should have. Um, 
So I'm basically an academic, and I'm 107 years old. Um, so um, I got rid of my Twitter account a long time ago. Um, death threats are horrible. Um, I have a Facebook account and nothing, and you know, a static web page that is about my scholarship. Um, mm -hmm. But right now I edit a book series um, on um, video games and tabletop games um, called Studies in Gaming. And if you wanted to find out about how we can talk about the stories told in games, that's the thing I would look at. It's about 50 books now. So if you were to just Google Capel, K-A-P-E-L-L, um, because everybody misspells it, and studies in gaming, you'd find a bunch of books on things as diverse as um, Dungeons and Dragons, and we just have a new Magic the Gathering book that just came out, um, mm -hmm. to, um, you know, Call of Duty. Um, so and everything and I'm j I just turned in a manuscript on the horizon games as I said so look at that um, and if you really wanted to talk to me you can find me on Facebook by my name so <laughs> but also as I said I, I will I, I will forward on any emails and, and get Matthew's comment as well uh, or just read your feedback when Matthew comes back on the air uh, which hopefully will be soon because it turns out there's a lot more in mythology that we haven't covered and in the future <laughs> we'll try to cover it in about 90 minutes I apologize we went on so long but there were monologues that needed to be had and points that needed to be made. Um, uh, so to everyone who's been listening, thank you so much for being a part of all this. To our members, just hold on for one more moment. We'll get to your Patreon section. Uh, but to everyone else, thank you so much. We have spoken. Bye.